In this video, we're going to take a look at the final experiment of the semester, which is uh, heat of neutralization. Um, so this experiment is going to focus on what you guys are learning in chapter six, uh, which involves thermochemistry. So uh, the topic that we're going to be looking at is calorimetry specifically, which is the process of accurately measuring the heat transfer during the course of a chemical reaction. So um, with calorimetry, these you, you probably have seen in class things like the calorimeter constant, specific heat capacity. These are all things that we're going to be talking about today. Now, the question is, is why would we want to measure something? Um, why would we want to measure the heat transferred by a, a chemical reaction? And there are several applications of calorimetry in real life. Um, the most notable one that you can think of is determining the calorie content of food. So when you look at the label of food packaging, there is a certain amount of calories in that food. Um, the way they come up with that is by determining how much energy is stored inside the food through calorimetry. Normally they don't do this for completed food stuff, but they'll do this for the starting materials, the, the raw products like flour or sugar. And then they, knowing that the finished product is based on a variety of different ingredients, they can figure out how many calories are in that, that finished product. And one thing that I think a lot of students don't realize is just how much energy is stored inside of, inside of food. So if you take a look at this video, this is a video on YouTube um, from the Mythbusters. They are going to look at the um, amount of energy that's released when they take coffee creamer and they basically take coffee, powdered coffee creamer, aerosolize it, meaning they take the powder and turn it into a cloud of dust and then they ignite it to look at how much um, energy is released. So we're gonna get it all, they're gonna get it all set up. So here they have their coffee creamer inside of this barrel. They're gonna use compressed air to shoot it up. And then they have a flare that's going, that's going to ignite the coffee creamer. And there you go. So you can see that just from coffee creamer, uh, a completely mundane item that we all have around our house um, that there's such a tremendous amount of energy stored in there that you can get a, a very large fireball probably one of the larger fireballs they produce on Mythbusters from coffee creamer so uh, with calorimetry you can see that the amount of energy that's stored inside of an organic molecule is significant and when it's released it's released in the form of heat which we can measure now there are other applications of calorimetry. Um, some are to determine how much energy is released by a reaction. This is very important in chemical engineering because when you're doing reactions at large scale, meaning when you're producing a product or you are um, running a sequence of synthetic steps and you're doing this with uh, thousands and thousands of kilograms, um, you have to make sure that you account for all the energy that you're producing. And if a large amount of energy is produced, um, you have to make sure that you can either cool the reaction enough to take that energy away or have a system in which you can remove the heat um, so that you don't get an explosion or a fireball during your, during your synthesis. So calorimetry is very important in terms of not only looking at um, energy in food, but also in looking at energy from just ke chemical reactions in general. So the reaction that we're going to be looking at today is a neutralization reaction. So we have to go back to chapter four and remember um, our remember about acid and base reactions and metathesis reactions. So when we combine an, a base like sodium hydroxide and an acid like HCl, um, we should be able to predict the products. And doing what we normally do with metathesis reactions, we're going to exchange the partners. So we're going to put the H plus on the um, OH minus and the Na plus with the Cl minus. And that's going to give us water and sodium chloride. Now, one thing we don't talk about in metathesis reactions is that, that heat is produced. So if you remember back when you were doing experiments um, four and five, in many cases, we asked you to put your fingers on the test tube when you were running a metathesis reaction and see if heat was either absorbed or released. Well, in the case of the NaOH and HCl, there was no observable change with the exception of the fact that the test tube may have warmed up a little bit. So the only way we knew that this reaction took place was from the heat that was produced. And in class, you probably learned that we can treat heat as a reactant or a product. So in an exothermic reaction like this, now the reason why I know this one is exothermic is because the heat is written on the product side. 
So when heat is given off, it's an exothermic reaction. If I were to put this heat on the other side and it were to be a, a reactant, then that would denote that it was endothermic or require energy. So in this case, this reaction is exothermic. And then, then we have to define what is the system and what is the surroundings. So in this case, because heat is being transferred and it's being released by the system, we have to define what the system is. And the system in this case is going to be the reaction. So the NaOH, the HCl, and the products, water and NaCl. And then the surroundings is going to be everything else. So all of these uh, reagents and, re and products are going to be stored inside of an aqueous solution. So there's going to be a whole bunch of extra water around that contain these ions, and that's going to be part of the surroundings. And then the test tube that this reaction was run in, or today in the beaker and calorimeter, those are also going to be the surroundings. So the heat can be transferred to those. And then finally, heat can also be transferred to everything else around it. So like if you have a hot cup of coffee and you put it on the bench top, that bench top is going to warm up from the coffee eventually. So in this case, where does energy flow? Well, energy is going to be flowing from the system to the surroundings because we see that heat is a product. And then if heat is flowing to the surroundings, what should happen to the temperature of the water? Well, if heat is being released, we would expect that the temperature of the water will increase. So that's what we're going to observe today. So in this case, if we had to assign a delta H of reaction, we would give this a delta H of reaction with a negative sign because heat is being lost by the reaction. So we're going to run two of these reactions with two different um, acids. So in the first one, we're going to run it with HCl. And in the second one, we're going to run it with acetic acid. And the question that you have to answer today is, which one of these reactions should give off more energy? And I'm going to give you a hint, meaning which one will have the larger delta H? In the, in, in the chapter four, there's a table of strong acids and strong bases, and hydrochloric acid is a strong acid. Now you'll notice that acetic acid does not appear in this table. So that should give you some indication as to which one of these reactions should produce more energy in the end. And the difference might be relatively small, but you should be able to predict based on the fact that one is strong and one is weak, which one should have the larger delta H. Okay, so the first thing we have to do is we have to calibrate the calorimeter. So all of the reactions today and all of our um, all of the processes that we're going to do today are going to be done in a calorimeter. And what a calorimeter is is basically a device that's used to contain as much heat as possible. So this is what our calorimeter looks like. It's basically an aluminum um, an, an, an aluminum bucket that has a little um, rubber gasket where we put a beaker and the beaker kind of sits on the gasket. And the way this insulates is by having a, um, a gap in between the beaker and the aluminum where there's just some air that's sitting there doing nothing. That air is acting like an insulator. So it's preventing the heat from being transferred from the glass to the aluminum um, by just having an air space there because air is a very poor conductor of heat. So that's our calorimeter for today. Now, you can see from this calorimeter, this is this calorimeter is a good calorimeter, but it's not something that's you know amazingly expensive. This is a relatively simple calorimeter. So it will absorb some heat. All calorimeters will absorb some heat um, from, from a reaction. So that means that we have to know something about this calorimeter. We have to measure its calorimeter constant, or big C. And the first part of this experiment is going to be to calibrate the calorimeter by measuring the calorimeter constant C so that we know how much heat this will absorb when we run our reactions. So a couple of other things, you'll notice that there's this stirrer that goes in and that's just to mix up the reagents. And then there is this uh, probe that's going in and this is our temperature probe. So that's how we measure it. This connects to the computer through the vernier system. So the way that we're going to measure our calorimeter constant is by mixing hot water and cold water together and using the heat transfer from the hot water and the hot water to the cold water and the calorimeter um, to determine the amount of energy that is uh, absorbed by the cold water and the calorimeter and then to calibrate the calorimeter. So when we put the when we take the hot water and we pour it into the cold water inside of our calorimeter, heat is going to get transferred. And so our heat source in this case is the hot water and the heat is going to go in two different directions. It's going to go to the cold water and it's also going to go to the calorimeter. Now, most of the heat will go to the water 
because the calorimeter is designed to keep the heat in the water, but a little bit will go to the calorimeter, and that's what we're going to find out, how much heat goes to the calorimeter. So the classic thing in Chapter 6 is to write the what we call the Q equation, where we say that one thing is losing energy and other things are gaining energy, and because of conservation of energy, uh, the left side must equal the right side, meaning our source of energy um, must equal the amount of energy that's transferred to the sink. And the sink in this case is the cold and the, the, the cold water and the calorimeter. Now the reason why I put a, a negative sign here is because we have to make sure that we account for directionality. The hot water is losing energy and that is being gained positively by the cold and the calorimeter. So I have to put a negative sign here to make sure that we have um, this is to make sure that we have the correct directionality for everything. So now let's start plugging some things in. So if we want to know what the heat transfer for the hot is going to be, we use MC delta T. Now we have two different heat capacities in this case. We have what we have we have what's called a specific heat capacity, and this has units of joules per gram degree Celsius, and therefore we have to have a mass and a delta T in order to get the joules out. The other heat capacity is a just a what we call the calorimeter constant or just a heat capacity. It's not a specific heat capacity, but just a heat capacity. This has units of joules per degree Celsius. And what's built into this is all of the information, meaning the mass and the uh, meaning all of the, the information about the mass is built into this constant. So we basically treat the calorimeter as one large constant. So we have, for the hot water, we have the mass of the hot water, the specific heat capacity of water, and then we have a delta T. For the cold water, we have the mass of the cold water, the specific heat capacity of the water, and delta T. And then for the calorimeter, we have the heat capacity for the calorimeter, or the calorimeter constant, times delta T. Now, what about delta T? So we remember from chapter 6 that delta T is equal to the final temperature minus the initial temperature. So one of the things that we have to be very careful with in this lab is making sure that we know what the final and what the initial is. So when, let's start with the hot water. So when this experiment starts, the initial temperature is going to be the temperature of the hot water. And then when we combine everything, the temperature of the hot water is going to come down, right? So let's say that we start with 60 degree water for the hot water, when we mix it with the cold water, it's the temperature is going to wind up being somewhere in between 60 degrees C and the temperature of the cold water, which is maybe 28 degrees C or something like that. So we're going to wind up with the temperature in between 60 and 28. So for the hot water, this is going to be the equilibrium temperature, which is the temperature that it, the mixture of the hot and cold reaches um, at, after they're mixed, minus the initial temperature, which was the temperature of the hot. So just keep this in mind that we're going to get uh, the equilibrium temperature minus the hot temperature, and this is going to wind up giving us a negative number. Now that is why the negative sign here is important, because it accounts for the fact that we have a negative uh, delta T. And then if we do the other side, we have the cold water and the calorimeter. Now these two are going to start at the same temperature. So the way we think about this is that the cold water and the calorimeter are going to equilibrate before the experiment starts, and they're going to be um, and they're going to be at the same temperature. So it helps that we're using essentially room temperature water, meaning water that's been sitting out at room temperature. So that means that everything by doing that, that means that everything is going to be at the same temperature anyway. So even if the cold water came out of the tap a little cold, we allow it to equilibrate with room temperature to make sure that it's the same temperature as the as the calorimeter. So in this case, the cold water and the calorimeter are going to rise in temperature because we're adding the hot water to them. So in this case, we're going to get positive delta Ts because the equilibrium temperature is going to be something higher than the cold temperature. So we're going to get positive delta Ts there. And the signs are really important here. So now if we want to calculate big C, what we can do is we can move this whole term, m cold C, T eq minus T cold over to the left. So we're going to subtract that from both sides. And then I get that the hot minus the hot minus the cold is equal to big C delta T. And then if I want to get C by itself, I can divide both sides by the delta T for the C, and then I get this expression right here. 
So what we're basically doing is, is we're figuring out the hot, we're figuring out the cold, and the difference between those two is the amount of energy that was absorbed by the calorimeter, right? So if it's if the hot minus the cold was zero, then the calorimeter would have absorbed nothing. If the hot minus the cold was something other than zero, then the calorimeter absorbed something. So that's how we're going to get the calorimeter constant through this equation. Now, if C is 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius, we have to think about what the units of big C are. So you're going to be doing this in the experiment, but just to kind of show you, when you do the math up here, if we take the mass times the, the, the specific heat capacity, that's going to eliminate grams from the bottom. And then we also have the temperature here, which is in degrees Celsius. That's going to eliminate degrees Celsius from the bottom as well. So on top, we're going to have joules, which makes sense because these are the Q cold and the Q hot. So we're going to have joules, and then we're going to be dividing that by the temperature change, which has units of degrees Celsius. So our calorimeter constant is going to have units of joules per degree Celsius. And that's very important because that distinguishes it from the specific heat capacity C. Okay, so how are we going to do the experimental setup? So we pretty much described the experiment already, um, and in this case, there really is no reason to do a video because it's such a simple setup, and it's it's so easy to do that I can explain it to you, and I think you're going to understand. So um, we're going to basically measure out 75 mils of cool water, um, and this is water that's just been sitting out at the bench top. You're going to pour that into a graduated cylinder and place it in a beaker. So that beaker, then you're going to place that beaker inside of a calorimeter and measure the temperature of the cool water. So the temperature today that you measured uh, of your cold water in the calorimeter was 25.8 degrees Celsius. Okay, and then you're going to measure out 75 mils of hot water from the faucet. So we're just basically going to turn on the hot water, and we're going to get that hot water out, and that's going to have a temperature of 59.7 degrees C, about, about 60 degrees Celsius, but exactly 59.7 degrees Celsius. So now we have our hot water and our cold water, and what we're going to do is you're going to pour the hot water into the cold water, close the calorimeter, and then watch the temperature on the screen um, as uh, on the vernier system, and you're going to see that the temperature of the cold water is going to rise and then come to it an, uh, a kind of a flat part where it equilibrates. So that flat part that you reach is 38.5 degrees Celsius. And you'll notice that this is somewhere between the cold and the hot, which makes sense because now we're going to be at kind of like an average temperature between the two. So these are the three main data points you need, and then you also need to know how much water you had. So let's take a look at the data sheet. So one thing that I have in the data sheet is um, we need the mass of the hot water and the mass of the cold water. Uh, for today, although this is not the this is not 100% accurate because the density does change with temperature. We're going to assume for the purposes of this experiment that the density of water is one gram per mil. And what you're going to find out is that the error in this experiment that's associated with the calorimeter, um, meaning that the calorimeter is not perfect, is going to be significantly larger than the error that would be introduced by actually calculating the accurate masses of the water using the density at the different temperatures. So um, that's why we can sort of assume that the density is one because the, in, the error that's introduced by this assumption is small compared to the error introduced by the calorimeter that we have. Okay, so then we include the temperature of the hot water, the cold water, and the temperature at equilibrium. So these are the three temperatures that we measured. And then your job is gonna be to figure out the three components. So we have to figure out what is the Q that of the hot water, meaning, how much energy did the hot water transfer? And I take you through that equation that we came up with. Then we have the heat gain by the cold water. So this is going to be the uh, Q for the cold. And we know that the difference between the hot and the cold is going to give us what was absorbed by the calorimeter. So this is going to be Q cal. And then finally, if we want to get the calorimeter constant, we can take Q cal divided by the delta T to get the uh, calorimeter constant. And um, so there's a couple of things here that you have to make sure you do. Uh, the units through all of this have got to be done precisely. So you have to write down units for every single step. You also have to make sure that you do your significant figures precisely. You have some multiplications and you have some subtractions. So you have to make sure you're doing those sig figs right. And then at the very end for the calorimeter constant, you're gonna report that with whatever units it comes out to be from all the other units.
So that's how we get the calorimeter constant. And then now, whenever we have a delta T, we can figure out what that, how much energy that calorimeter absorbed. So in the second part of the experiment, we're going to use our device, our calorimeter device, and we're going to measure the delta H of reaction for neutralization reactions. So the way that we're going to set this up is similar. We're going to have an acid in a beaker and a base in a beaker. We're going to pour the acid into the base. And when we pour the acid into the base, they're going to react and we're going to get um, some heat that's transferred. So now in this case, the heat of the reaction is going to be is going to go in two different directions. We're going to give some heat to the cold water and we're going to give some heat to the calorimeter. Now, in this case, the cold water is actually the solution. So um, the combination of the HCl and NaOH aqueous solutions come together and that is our water sink. So it's the mixture. The, the liquid combination of the um, HCl and the NaOH gives us the cold water for this. So that, that's going to be our water. So in this case, we can write our Q equation and we can say, well, that we can say that whatever heat is either is lost by the reaction must be gained by the solution. And that's what I was talking about, about the cold water. This is the combination of the HCl and the NaOH solution and the calorimeter. So if we write that in, uh, minus Q of the reaction is going to be equal to the mass of the solution, which is going to be the combined masses of the HCl and the NaOH, times the specific heat capacity, which is 4.184, times delta T. And in this case, the delta Ts are more straightforward because we have everything starting at room temperature. Um, and then they're going to rise to whatever the warmer temperature is after the reaction is complete. So some of the energy is going to go into the solution and some of the energy is going to go into the calorimeter. Now here we've determined our calorimeter constant so we can we know how much energy is going to be transferred because we have the constant times the change in temperature and then that's going to give us what was absorbed by the calorimeter. So now here's the most important question. So this equation only gives us the heat transferred by the reaction. It doesn't give us a delta H. To get a delta H, we need to get two things. We need to get the energy that was transferred. And one thing that's important with a delta H is that you have to know the energy that's transferred has to be transferred at a constant pressure. Now that's going to be true in this experiment because the atmospheric pressure is not going to change significantly over the course of the reaction. So we satisfy one condition for measuring delta H. And then the other condition is that we normalize that heat per the number of moles that are taking part in the reaction. And the reason for that is because the heat is related to the stoichiometry of this reaction. So for every one mole of NaOH, we're going to get a certain amount of heat. And if we have two moles of NaOH, we're going to get twice as much heat as we would have if we had one mole. So there's a link between in, in the stoichiometry between the number of moles and the heat. So in this case, we're going to wind up using the exact same volumes and the exact same concentrations of HCl and NaOH, which means that if we're using this, uh, it's going to be 75 mils. Since we're using the same number of the same volume and the same concentration, we're using the same number of moles. So if you think about this in terms of limiting reagent, if we uh, with our with our experimental conditions, we're not going to have a limiting reagent. Basically, we're going to have these two being at the equivalence point, where the number of moles of NaOH is going to equal the number of moles of HCl. So we're going to get a complete reaction here where all of the NaOH and all of the HCl is used up since they're equimolar. So you can substitute in here either the moles of HCl or the moles of NaOH. It doesn't matter because they're the same. If we were to give you a problem, though, where you weren't sure which one was the limiting reagent, or if you weren't sure if we had reached the equivalence point for a reaction, you would have to do a limiting reagent problem in order to figure out which one is the limiting reagent. And then that is what goes on the bottom. Because remember, the entire reaction is controlled by the limiting reagent. So the amount of heat that's produced will be controlled by the limiting reagent. So um, make sure you think about that when you're working on the homework problems, um, the post lab problems and other things. So what you're going to do is you're going to convert the 75 mils of HCl to moles of HCl, knowing that the concentration is one molar. OK. So for the experimental setup, here's what we're going to do in this case. Um, we are going to take it. Uh, we're going to measure out 75 mils of one molar NaOH with a graduated cylinder, and then we're going to place it in a beaker.
So that's going to go into our calorimeter, and then we're going to measure the temperature. So the temperature of that NaOH is 24.7 degrees Celsius. And then you're going to measure out 75 mils of one molar HCl and measure its temperature. So in this case, the temperature of the HCl is the same as the temperature of the NaOH because they've been just sitting out equilibrating with the atmosphere. So um, when you stick the thermometer in, you get just about the same result. If they were different, then we would have to do something a little bit more complex to figure out um, what was going on. But in this case, because we've allowed them to equil equilibrate at room temperature, the average temperature is going to be 24.7 degrees Celsius. So then what you're going to do is you're going to pour the acid solution into the beaker with the base solution in the calorimeter. So you're going to open this up, pour your acid in, mix the two of them up, and wait for the temperature to come up to an equilibrated temperature. So the final temperature that you reach is 29.6 degrees Celsius. So heat was definitely released because our temperature goes up. So that was the first experiment. And then you're going to repeat this setup. But in, this, in the second time you repeat it, so you're going to take a fresh 75 mils of NaOH, take its temperature. Then you're going to take a fresh 75 mils of acetic acid of the same concentration, one molar. And you're going to run this again. And the data for this is given in part three of the data sheet. So we're going to compare the delta H of reaction for the strong acid relative to the weak acid acetic acid. So if you look at the data sheet, I'll kind of walk you through. So you'll notice that we have part two and part three, and you're given the same set of data. You're given an in, the average temperature of the NaOH HCl, and you're given the temperature of the solution at equilibrium, which is 29.6 here or 28.2 here. So the mass of the solution is going to be the combined mass of the acid and the base. And again, we're going to assume that the density is one gram per mil. So now we're going to work through and figure out what was absorbed by the solution. So this is going to be the mass of the solution, which is the combined mass, times the specific heat capacity times the temperature change, where this is the temperature at equilibrium, or the final temperature, minus the initial temperature, which is the temperature of the acid in the base. And then we're also going to measure the heat gained by the calorimeter using the calorimeter constant from part one times the uh, change in temperature. So we get the combined amount of energy transferred. And then to get the heat of the reaction, we basically sum those up. And then we put the minus sign here because whatever is being gained by these is being lost by the reaction. And then you're going to calculate your number of moles of HCl or NaOH. The reason why we have HCl or NaOH is because in this case they are the same and um, there is the, they're, they're at the equivalence point so there is no um, limiting reagent. And then I write here, if this was not the case, you'd have to calculate which reagent was the limiting reagent. And then you calculate the enthalpy of the reaction by taking the heat of the reaction divided by the moles of HCl. Now you should note that in this final step, when you do this calculation, um, per convention, the units have to be in kilojoules per mole. So up here, you can have units of joules, if you like, but down here, you have to have it in units of kilojoules per mole. So that's your target for this. And then the same goes for the acetic acid. And then at the very end, you can compare the heat of the reaction for the uh, acetic acid and the heat of the reaction for the HCl. And then you could see if your hypothesis was correct. Would you, based on knowing that one is strong and one is weak, which one should have the higher um, heat of reaction? So this takes you through the calculations. Um, a couple of warnings about this experiment. When you're doing the data analysis, you have to have proper units for every line. So every line has to have a unit. Don't leave that out or you're going to lose points. You have to have proper significant figures for every line, meaning when you, you've, you're given experimental data and you have to make sure that you follow the significant figures all the way through on every line. You will lose points if you don't do significant figures. And then the third warning is be very careful with signs. So all of the equations are designed to handle the signs. So if you get a negative from one of these, you have to put the negative in when you write it down. And then that will be taken into consideration. Like, for example, here, you have to make sure that you add the negative to this in order to get the correct sign for the delta H. So again, so to kind of repeat, um, Units, significant figures, signs. Those are the three most important things for this experiment, in addition to understanding calorimetry and um, the equations that we're using and the difference between heat capacity and specific heat capacity.
Okay, guys, good luck. If you have any, if you have any questions, you can contact your section instructors. Um, and this will be due, this, this data sheet will be uploaded um, at your regularly scheduled, at the end of your regularly scheduled lab time for Experiment 11.